Welcome to the presentation, Wetlands, the Ordinary and the Extraordinary. I'm Leslie Kaiser, Garden Coordinator with CURE and a moderator for this session. Our presenter this afternoon is Victoria Justice. In her capacity as a master gardener, Victoria has revealed her passion for the natural world in self-authored presentations to civic groups, gardening clubs, and schools across Northwest Indiana. Being a master naturalist and amateur photographer rounds out her abilities to bring nature indoors to adults and children alike, stirring imaginations as well as awareness. Victoria, we're excited to have you. Anything you'd like to add? I think you've covered all the bases and I thank you for that. It's good to be here with you. I understand that some of you know a good deal about wetlands and others maybe not so much. So what we're gonna do is cover a few basics and then mention a few distinctions. And then we will delve into some areas that I'm sure are going to pique your interest. So walk this way. Join me in a virtual tour of wetlands, the ordinary and the extraordinary. First, let's figure out exactly what a wetland is. It starts with the soil. The soil in a wetland is wet, waterlogged, very, very, very wet. We call it hydric soil. Water in that soil displaces oxygen. So it's a very low oxygen mix. The water in a wetland, it either covers the soil or it's at the soil level. And then there's the vegetation in a wetland. The plants that grow there are determined by the soil and the water. The plants are called hydrophytic. They are the ones that enjoy wet feet. Here are just a very few plants that you might see in a wetland. You'll see rushes, sphagnum moss. Everyone knows what lily pads are. And willows, willows love wet feet. In the photo, we can see cattails. Cattails abound in wetlands. They are the royalty of wet-footed plants. If you plant them in dry soil, they will die. And they serve a very distinct purpose in wetlands. They slow the flow of water there. That's why they grow so densely. Nature created them to be the ones that slow down water in wetlands. So now that you know what the criteria are, let's use your skills and try and decide if what we see here is a wetland. Well, we see water and plenty of it. Let's look at the soil. Does the soil look waterlogged? It looks to me like it's very, very sandy. And the plants, are they hydrophytic? It seems that they are marum grass and marum grass just loves to hold down a sand dune. So this does not qualify to be called a wetland, does not meet the criteria. Now I was excited when I was researching this program to come across this 1926 geologic survey. If you look closely, this vertical line here is the state line, Indiana here, Illinois here, Lake Michigan way up here. This is South County, South Cook County. And if you look closely, this yellow area down here is the Glenwood stage, the ancient shore of Lake Michigan. And here is the Calumet shore. If you look at these lines, they represent a road going across the very top of that ridge. Ironically, it's called Ridge Road. So when you travel down Ridge Road, you're traveling down the ancient shore of Lake Michigan. And this is the most recent shore. This is the Tolleston shore. 
And I was really gratified to see this, this survey because if you look right about here, that's where I grew up. Who knew that I was on an ancient sand dune? This other um, drawing is really interesting. Lake Michigan here is called Lake Chicago. And the shoreline is the Glenwood stage, this one right down here. And if you look at this tiny little island here, you probably can't read what it says. It says Blue Island, a familiar name. And the verbiage here explains that we're looking at the Valparaiso Moraine. It's a ridge that runs from just across the Wisconsin line from Illinois, down through Illinois, hugging the shore of Lake Michigan, all the way around and up into Michigan itself. It's a very long moraine. So tuck that name into your memories. We'll come back to the Valparaiso Moraine. We have here a mock-up. It's a, it's a diagram that shows us exactly what a watershed is. Wherever you are, you're in a watershed. And very simply, it's an area that has a high point and a low point, so that when water falls on that land in the form of precipitation, it flows downhill. It can flow through a number of different areas on its journey. It's flowing toward that lowest place right here that is the wetland. It's rather roomy. There's room for expansion there. Lots of elbow room. And when that water comes downhill through different areas, it picks up hitchhikers. It can pick up anything that's on or in the ground at that point. And it carries it along with the water into the wetland. Now, think back to the Valpo Moraine. If you've ever been at Gabus Arboretum at Purdue Northwest, formerly known as Tall Tree Arboretum, you have stood on the continental divide of the Valpo Moraine. If your house is north of that Valparaiso Moraine, water in your watershed will flow northward until it finds its way to Lake Michigan, it goes through the Great Lakes to the St. Lawrence and finds the ocean. It finds the Atlantic because water wants to find the ocean. If your house is south of that continental divide of the Valpo Moraine, water will drain south. It will find the Kankakee, then the Mississippi, and it will find the Gulf because water wants to find the ocean. This is a side view, just another view of a watershed so that you can be aware that not only is a process going on above ground, but also below. Gravity is pulling the water that does soak into the ground, pulls it down, to the lowest place. While it's moving, it passes through the lower level of that watershed of the wetland where water again travels downstream. Now that we've got that groundwork taken care of, what's the big deal with a wetland? It's just a wet spot just a wet spot. But there's so very much more to a wetland than meets the eye. We talked about how water travels through a watershed and picks up various elements so that by the time that water reaches the wetland, it can be pretty polluted. But here's the magic. 
through the action of the soil and plants in a wetland, that water is purified. The phosphates, the toxins, fertilizer, animal waste, even heavy metals from industry can be removed. That's pretty miraculous. That means that water coming into a wetland and goes through the process is cleaner when it leaves the wetland. And if that wetland has a downstream exit, access to water flowing downstream beyond it, the wetland is contributing water that's cleaner than when it came into the wetland. And then multiply that times every wetland in the country. When it rains here in Indiana anymore in the summer, it seems to rain really hard. We have gully washers after a dry spell. And it's like spitting in the, in the dirt when this heavy rain falls on the crusty, sun-hardened earth. Not much soaks in. It runs off. But we're in a, in a watershed. So where does that water go? It flows downhill and into the wetland in your watershed, where we can think of that wetland as a giant sponge. It has plenty of room to hold flood water and hold the water it does. And when danger of flooding is passed, the wetland only then slowly, slowly, slowly releases that excess water. Now we know about CO2 and not letting it go into the atmosphere. We know that's not a good thing. I'll bet you didn't know that a wetland is a carbon sink. The plants and soil in wetlands sequester carbon, they hold it. And the only way that it can be released is if the wetland is destroyed. 70% of Indiana residents depend on groundwater for drinking. Not everybody is like us. We can live right next door to Lake Michigan. So 70% of our residents in Indiana need clean groundwater to drink. How does that come about? We see in this cutaway the access that wetlands have to groundwater and aquifers so that water that has been cleaned by the soil and plants in a wetland finds its way into the groundwater and recharges it. Can't get much better than that. And I must say that retention basins and the like don't perform that same uh, function as a wetland. They hold water for a time and that's about all. Let's talk about the habitat that wetlands provide. Not only a duck or a goose in a wetland, Wetlands are the most diverse ecosystem on the planet, the most. We have microbes in abundance, macroinvertebrates, plants, insects, amphibians, reptiles, birds, waterfowl, mammals, all of those in great abundance. Wetlands are a refuge for migrating waterfowl and they are a nursery to many species. The ducks, the geese go in there to lay their eggs in their nests and to raise their young, as do birds. If you've been to the Highland Heron Rookery, you've seen their big stick nests in the tops of trees. They build their nests where food is abundant for their young. And then we have all the wonderful benefits that we can enjoy one-on-one, -on -one, up close and personal in a wetland. We can take our children there, our grandchildren, and teach them what nature is about. Because if we don't teach them when they're young, 
They're not going to have that luxury as adults. Ingrain it into their systems. Show them how wonderful nature is. We can observe, we can recreate, we can picnic, canoe, we can go fishing. We can use our cell phone cameras and take gorgeous photos. If we're so talented, we can paint a picture. We can do research or we can go there and just be. One of the big perks is that we get goodies from wetlands. We can get fish and shellfish, blueberries, cranberries, wild rice, even some medicinals. And the gardeners know all about the peat. If you'll notice the background photo, you'll see a plant that red admirals are nectaring on. That plant is called buttonbush. And those spheres are covered with hundreds of minuscule flowers. And you wouldn't think that a butterfly could get much from a tiny little flower, but they will spend hours nectaring on those plants. They're common residents of wetlands. When we talk about the diversity in wetlands, we can easily compare it with the diversity in coral reefs and rainforests. Ecosystems were created and evolved to function with all their components present. They work in concert. It's kind of like the wheel on your bike. You're rolling down the highway, all your spokes are in place, everything is wonderful until you hit a pothole, you're out of control and you smack into a tree losing a third of your spokes. No more smooth ride and you're wondering when that wheel is going to collapse. A Purdue study goes a step farther. It tells us that when diversity decreases, disease increases. So there's a double whammy. Vital elements are lost and disease strikes. So diversity is always our goal. It's what we strive for. One third of threatened and endangered species <clears throat> live only in wetlands. Wetlands are critical to the species that live there, critical for their survival. But are wetlands always wet? Nope, not always. There are wetlands that are called ephemeral or isolated. They don't have any downstream outlet they might be a low spot in a farm field. We've seen them as we drive through the countryside. In the spring, the snow melt finds those depressions. And then come the spring rains to add more water. We might see a duck floating around in there. What really gets excited about those little wetlands are the frogs and toads. They see them and they jump right in and begin laying their eggs. And at the same time, here come the insects. Starting with the dragonflies, they lay their eggs in that pond as well. And isn't it serendipitous that by the time the frogs start absorbing their tails and their legs are grown and it's time to leave the pond, they have been fed by the eggs of those insects. And then it's time for the water to evaporate and be gone. Where does it go? Some evaporates. The rest of it finds its way to the groundwater that that tiny little wetland has purified on its way downward. So the water is cleaner when it goes down in and it is recharging groundwater. It's the first line of defense, actually for recharging groundwater. And please don't forget, wetlands are transition zones. They form the link of land and water. It's really important. And by their action, the land, as well as the air, as well as the water, 
are protected. This big fat beaver is climbing out of the wetland behind my house. Uh, he's here to tell us that wetlands are divided into categories. We have marshes, swamps, fens, and bogs. Um, and yes, this, this greedy, hungry beaver really tried to eat my yard. Here's a marsh. Again, this is a, a photo taken out my bedroom window. We see mother mallard taking her kids for a swimming lesson. And there is mother turtle. She has laid her eggs and she's sunning herself to show just how diverse this area can be. The water is shallow in a marsh and the soil beneath is mineral poor. We see mostly grasslands in that area. The water can be salty or fresh, salty as in coastal marsh. And these marshes often appear near lakes and rivers. The example of a swamp type of wetland we use today is the 700 acre, most gorgeous Okefenokee Swamp located on the Florida Georgia line. The water in this particular swamp is, a, is black water. As a matter of fact, it is the largest black water swamp in the United States, maybe even in all of North America. The water is deeper in a swamp. There is a slow moving current. Even if it's imperceptible, there is a current. As a matter of fact, two waterways, two rivers find their source in the Okefenokee. The St. Mary River flows into the Atlantic Ocean. The Suwannee River flows into the Gulf because water wants to find the ocean. So the Okefenokee swamp type of wetland does have outlets, downstream flowing water. The trees that you find in the Oki can be cypress, the ones that have knees. And if you look really closely, you can, you can see a knee right here. Um, you might find mangroves as well. But the real big feature at the Okefenokee Swamp are the animals. Black bear, bobcat, beaver, otters, 200 species of birds, 60 species of amphibians. Uh, that includes, by the way, the ever popular pig frog. Instead of croaking, the pig frog snorts and grunts. And if you're very lucky, you will see one of the three foot salamanders. Who knew? Don't forget about the gators and a few important snakes to watch out for. When is a bog not a bog? When it's a fen. Henry Coles, a U of C professor, studied this area in Northwest Indiana for a long time. Through his studies, he concluded that the area was indeed a bog. Some years later, it was determined that groundwater is admitted. This is not a bog, but it is a fen. The change in name doesn't detract from how wonderful this uh, area is. The day that I visited, I filled an entire card in my camera with photographs. There's so much to see, so much to take wonderful photos of. Bogs, my friends, are a totally different animal. We have a bog here in Indiana called Pinhook Bog off Wozniak Road. It's in Laporte. And it's quite uh, an unusual and very wonderful place. It happens to be a glacial kettle lake. That means it was formed by a glacier. Um, as the Wisconsin glacier was receding 15,000 years ago, a huge chunk of it broke off into the glacial till. Ever so slowly, that chunk melted. The weight of that chunk of ice 
was on a layer of clay. And over time, it became impermeable so that the final situation that that chunk found itself in was the liquid state. That water could not escape through the kettle shaped bottom. It's kind of a bowl shape. It couldn't get out because it, the clay was impermeable. But that meant that groundwater could not come in either to dilute the water in the kettle. It could not bring in nourishing minerals from the ground. So the water in Pinhook Bog is very low nutrient water. If you look at the background photo of this slide, you'll see what grows in Pinhook Bog. Sphagnum moss. Sphagnum moss through cation exchange makes that water very acidic. It has a pH of about three. It's as acidic as orange juice. And that's what this sphagnum is flourishing in. So we have cold, acidic, low nutrient water. It's quite a fragile little ecosystem. And that important difference again between bogs and fens is an opening in the base to admit groundwater or not. The only water that comes to the bog now, to Pinhook Bog, is in the form of precipitation, rain, snow, and that from groundwater, uh, not groundwater, from runoff from the surrounding area. Nothing from the ground is admitted. The sphagnum moss that grows there is very water retentive. And that's something we have to, have to tuck back away in our little memories. It's water retentive. In years past, Native Americans dried this moss and Native American moms used it as baby diapers. That's how water retentive it is. And the added benefit was sphagnum releases antimicrobial benefits, antifungal, antibacterial properties in that moss. So those little babies had no diaper rash ever. One autumn day, a few years ago, I packed up my camera and I drove over past 421 to Wozniak Road and I parked in the lot and walked through the woods and came to the bog. This was before um, tours with rangers were required. Now, when you wanna go on a tour of Pinhook, it'll be on a Saturday afternoon and you will be guided by a ranger because this is now a part of the park system. So how do you go on a tour? You walk down this boardwalk. And as I said, this was before the, the tours had to be guided. This person is doing what I did that day, taking photos. And from where that person is, I'm, I'm sure that they were taking a picture of the lady slippers, the orchids that grew there. You see all kinds of plants here. You see acid loving berry bushes, blueberries, cranberries. You see some ferns down here. You see tamarack trees, the deciduous conifers that drop their needles. Now, if you were to take a, um, a hike on this boardwalk with five of your best friends, walk all the way out to the end of the boardwalk and all of you at the count of three, jump together, three, two, one, and you jump, you realize when you have landed that the boardwalk is bobbing. And then, oh my gosh, everything around you is bobbing. The trees, the bushes, the plants, the moss, everything is bobbing. Hence the name, Quaking Bog. Why is everything bobbing up and down? 
It's because everything that you see growing is growing in a six foot mat of sphagnum moss. Water retentive sphagnum moss. And the plants that grow there are either plants that are acid loving or plants that have a tough time finding a place to grow almost anywhere. And they are choosing to grow here. Um, plants like this really unusual rusty cotton grass. What about those plants that grow here? How would we describe them? We would describe them as specialized, as unique. And here's a short list of what might be seen growing at Pinhook Bog. We saw the rusty cotton grass and we saw the tamarack trees and the ferns. There's also something that we didn't see. When you take your tour, be aware, listen to what the, the ranger tells you because you will see poison sumac growing there and he'll instruct you to stay away from it, not to touch it. Again, you'll see the sphagnum moss, you'll see orchids, you'll see the pink lady slippers. They're, they're just breathtakingly beautiful. The cranberries, the blueberries, um, even holly. You'll see button bush that we talked about. Button bush will be growing in what's called the moat of the bog. The moat is at the perimeter of the bog. The water there is dilute because of the runoff and the plants that grow in the, in the moat of the bog are plants that don't like it quite so acidic like button bush. We're seeing the button bush again here and arum plants. One last thing that grows at Pinhook are the carnivorous plants. This is not a carnivore. This is something I got very excited about. I didn't take this photo on the autumn visit. I took it on a summer visit. It's an orange fringed orchid, this one right here. And I was thrilled beyond words, not only to get a picture of it, but to have it turn out. We spoke of carnivores. Pitcher plant. This is not a flower. This is a modified leaf that evolved to hold liquid. It catches rainwater, it catches snow melt, and it adds some of its own magic potion to that water, and it serves quite a purpose. You can see what might be described as the edge of the leftover leaf when the two sides met, when that curled up and evolved to be a receptacle. This is the hood of the leaf. Before it was a pitcher, it was just the tip of the leaf. It has modified itself over time. It has wonderful coloring. I love the designs. And notice very closely these downward facing hairs, small hairs, and they're rather pointy. How does this work? Well, this lip on the front of the plant exudes a sticky, sweet substance that will attract an insect. It might even attract a little salamander. It might even attract a small mousie. So let's use a fly as an example. The fly comes swooping in and sees that some material is on this lip and it gets closer and realizes that it's some wonderful, sweet, sticky goop. And it lands and begins to partake and it follows down into the pitcher. And then it realizes that it can't go any farther. There's liquid and it better get out of Dodge. So it turns around and tries to escape. The sides are very slick. If it manages to get this far up, it's pushed back by the prickly hairs. Eventually it gets tired, falls in, drowns, and the enzymes in the water digest the insect or whatever little critter falls in. Think about this. That plant grows in 
nutrient poor conditions. So it's learned to feed itself. Amazing. Why is this pitcher green and this one is mainly red? Now there are two pictures here, by the way. This one is not growing a new top. This is two of them. And you have a disadvantage photographing off the boardwalk because you can't move around your subject. You, you are bound to stay in a certain, you know, area. And then if you're on a tour with a group of people, there may not be a lot of room for you to, to uh, move around. But this plant is red because it's exposed to more sun. You can see that the sphagnum moss that it's growing in is bleached out from excess sun. And it doesn't do the, the picture any harm at all. It just changes its color, much like we get a suntan in the summer. Now, this one is green, mainly green. Maybe this one gets a little more sun. And we can also see how the babies look and how they grow in a rosette fashion. Um, that's how their colonies um, are, are uh, grown. This is the unique flower of a pitcher plant. It's got this bun-shaped flower in the front, and I'm pretty sure that these are not petals, but they're sepals instead. And there's a space in between to admit pollinators. Very unusual flower. And I'm pretty sure that these are little um, blue-eyed grass. Two more carnivores at Pinhook. These are spoon leaf sundews. They look to me like little fireworks explosions. And imagine at the end of each of these stems is a spoon shaped affair. And from the edges of that spoon shaped leaf are tentacles. At the end of each tentacle comes more sweet sticky goop, the bait that attracts the insect. So when an insect detects all this good, sweet, sticky goop, it lands to partake and it immediately is stuck. And pretty soon that leaf curls up and it furls in as just the same way that a fern grows and it unfurls, this one furls up so that the plant can release its digestive juices and the bug becomes lunch. You see the little sparkly affairs into the water here. Those are bladder warts. And their trapping mechanism is a tiny bladder. It's kind of clear and it has a trap door, a trap door that only opens in. It attracts an insect, the door opens, the insect comes in, the door closes, it does not open out and that little buggy becomes lunch. I have one thing to say about the blueberries at Pinhook, delicious. As I was leaving the bog, I wanted to document my departure. So I took this photo and I came home and I put the, the card from my camera on my computer. Imagine my surprise when I saw this. This looks like an eye, does it not? And over here, another one. And at the end of the boardwalk, I'm going to walk into the forest through this gaping maw for an October trip. That was kind of spooky, I have to say. Speaking of mysterious, Northwest Europe has its own share of bogs. And we know that the peat from bogs has traditionally been cut and used to heat people's homes there. And when people were cutting peat, they found things in the bog. And one of the things they found often was a keg of preserved butter. Now, in the bog, we have acidic conditions. We have antimicrobial action, antibacteria, antifungal. The water is cold. Everything in that bog contributes to preservation. That butter, I don't know that I would put it on my toast, but both the keg and the butter are preserved. 
And there are many of these kegs that have been retrieved from the bog. That many people cannot forget where they put their keg. And other items found in the bog have led archeologists to conclude that sacrifices were offered to the bog. Early man didn't understand what the bog was. They found it rather mysterious. And they were almost um, using it as a deity. They would offer ritual sacrifices, all kinds of sacrifices for various reasons. Now, weaponry was found in the bog. Could it be that this was the weaponry of vanquished foes? Could be. Look at this orange disc. You can see by the radiocarbon dating that this five, almost 5,000 year old piece of carved wood is preserved. It's hard to believe that. I can't wrap my head around it. That, my friends, is a wheel, a carved wheel, preserved and retrieved from a bog. And now the age of this one just boggles the mind. It's not a throwing stick, although it looks like one. It's very, very old and it's perfectly preserved. It's a very primitive dugout canoe. In the grand scheme of things, the ritual sacrifices to bogs included human sacrifice. The picture here is of a specific, and I'm, I'm not saying this disrespectfully, but the phrase is used continually, bog bodies. Um, this bog body is the most perfect complete specimen retrieved from a bog in Europe. Perfectly preserved, look at his expression. He looks as though he were sleeping. His hair is turned that same orange color as the wheel. The fur in his leather cap is also kind of orangey. And even the necklace on his, under his chin is still present. Everything about his person is perfectly preserved. And scientists are wondering why he has this very peaceful expression on his face to make it look like he is in a peaceful sleep. People wonder if he knew from the time that he was young that one day he would have the honor of being a sacrifice to the bog, we will never know. And how do we know that he was a sacrifice? This is not a necklace around his neck. It's the noose that he was hung by. This is Tolland man and a reproduction was made of him to put in the Silkeborg Museum in Denmark because as soon as he was extracted from the bog, he began to deteriorate. Those protective conditions that he had in the bog are no longer present. And scientists scrambled to find out how to stop that decay from happening. And eventually they did find it, but by the time they found it, the head became detached from the body and they had to carefully make a, a cast of him and the cast the, the uh, mock-up of the Talon man is what's in the museum, not the original at all. One last thing that I'd like to talk about in relation to bogs is Windover. Windover is a place. Um, it is very, very old. The, the um, human remains that were taken from the bogs that we were discussing earlier are probably Iron Age, Bronze Age humans. We can see these are much, much older. Windover was discovered by a developer who was in the early process 
of creating a very upscale subdivision. And it seems that the actual developer himself was on a backhoe and he made the first dig at that site um, in preparation to build. As soon as he got that first shovel full up, he turned off the backhoe, jumped off and scooted off to find what he knew he needed to find archeologists. And when the archeologists arrived, they agreed that it was a very important find. What they discovered was a pond that had a layer of peat at the bottom. It didn't resemble in any way a peat bog, just had that little bit of peat at the bottom. It was discovered that the pond was a community underwater burial ground. The remains were not preserved as regards the soft tissue. The soft tissue was not preserved, but the skeletal remains were. And even with that meager evidence, the archeologists were able to determine a whole lot of stuff forensically about the people that lived at Windover. They couldn't open a stomach the way archeologists did for Tolland Man. For Tolland Man, they opened his stomach and found 40 different grains and seeds, which led them to conclude that his sacrifice was made in the winter. There was no fresh food in his stomach, eating all these, these dried grains. At Windover, there was no stomach, but where the stomach should have been was a collection of undigested and partially digested food. In that way, scientists learned that these people at Windover had an excellent diet. They ate fish, they ate meat, veggies, fruit, seeds, nuts, a very healthy diet. They were hunter gatherers, but they were not nomadic. Everything they needed was nearby. Were they farmers? Did Stone Age people farm? Good question. Good question. In stomachs, where stomachs used to be, herbs were found. These folks used herbs as medicinals. Everything that I, that I learned about this just, just blew my mind. Not only were human remains found, but articles of daily living were found at Windover. It seems that the folks who were interred were interred with some of their articles of daily living. Children were interred with their favorite toys. And looking at those articles of daily living, the scientists were astounded. The baskets that were woven by these folks were amazingly beautiful. The tools that they found were well thought out, made of bone, antlers, you know how hard antlers are if your dog chews on one, and even shark teeth. And the toys were sweet replicas of the tools that their parents used, that the adults used. It was found that these people were a very caring and kind society. How in the world did scientists figure that out? By the human remains that were found. Very elderly people were found. People with Physical deformities were found. People who had been ill or injured were found. Other societies during that time period might have ostracized those people and not taken the time or the effort to care for them. An example at Wendover was a 15 year old boy with spina bifida. He was not ambulatory. And as a matter of fact, 
at some point lost a foot. Maybe a gator chomped off his foot. We don't know. But he did not get an infection. He did not get osteomyelitis. The stump was perfectly healed. And he didn't pass away until he, until he was 15 years old. I can't even conceive of how a child could survive to 15 in the Stone Age with that physical condition. Totally amazing. And one last really earth-shaking thing was found there. The remains were shrouded. In what, you might ask? In cloth. These folks had looms big enough to weave cloth from the twiny thread that they produced. It was made of plant fibers, twisted, looked much like our twine, rather coarse, and it was woven on their looms in cloth. These Stone Age people didn't wear skins. They wore cloth. Amazing, amazing stuff. Out of the 168 individuals who were extricated from this burial plot, 91 of them had skulls containing brain matter. And are you thinking, did they test it? Did they test the DNA? Yes, they did. It was anticipated that the DNA would be of natives of the areas indigenous. And there was some of that. The majority of the DNA found was European. Oh, and I didn't tell you where Windover is. It's not too far from Cape Kennedy in Florida. The most important find archeologically in North America. And the archeologists who investigated that site in their infinite wisdom, put everything back the way it was. They took out the drains that partially drained a, a part of it. They only explored a third of it. And everything was put back the way it was. If you walk past it today, you, didn't know, you wouldn't know what it was because they knew that down the road, there would be better investigative tools to further analyze that area. Here in the United States, in the 1700s, we had 25% of our land mass covered with wetlands. Today, 5%. The state, having lost most of its wetlands, they get the crown, they've lost 91%. That's California. But we shouldn't gloat because we're tied in fourth place with Missouri. Threats to wetland, we might imagine urbanization. We might imagine growing crops. Many, many threats to wetlands exist. The Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the EPA came in the Nixon administration. And we can see with the inception of the Clean Water Act, many fewer wetlands were destroyed. By the 90s, so many, so many fewer were destroyed. And by 2010, the number was 13,000 acres, which is a, a lot. We know it's a lot, but it's considered insignificant for this particular study. There was a time when farmers were actually paid to convert wetlands into farmland. And a few years later, We've got farmers being paid to revert them back to wetlands. And you're probably thinking, how can I help? What can I do? I'm only one person. We've got to do everything that we can to preserve the remaining wetlands now that we've seen the importance, the critical importance of them. We have to do everything we can to preserve what we've got and we need to be conservative. We know about watersheds and how all of the 
the hitchhikers attach themselves to the water and end up in our wetlands. If you even have a wetland in your watershed. And then there's restoration. Is that even possible? Ask the friends of Hackmatech. They started out with a 12 acre conservation easement and they now have a national wildlife refuge. Hackmatech is on the Wisconsin Illinois line. It's here. The green areas are conservation areas. The brown areas are proposed core areas and the tan area is the connection, the corridor that links them all together. The Friends of Hackmatech have a goal. It's to improve and restore 11,000 acres, thousand acres of wetland, prairie and forest habitat. And then they will even help landovers, should they ask for it, for help in restoring their own land. This is a photo, again, of Gabus Arb. When the land was purchased, part of it was depleted farmland. It was determined that it used to be a wetland. With great research and preparation, the wetland actually was restored, and this is how we see it today. It's like that baseball movie, build it and they will come. I have for you a few facts to carry with you. The first one, did you know that just an acre of wetland can store a million and a half gallons of flood water? Did you know up to a half, one half of American bird species nest or feed in wetlands? And the last, did you know that although wetlands occupy only 5% of the land surface of the lower 48 states, they are home to almost a third of our plant species. On that note, I challenge you. What do you think? Are wetlands simply ordinary or extraordinary? <laughs>